you can either learn to focus on the solutions or you can dwell on the problems and let it destroy you. Hello, writers, and welcome to the Writer's Mindset Podcast with me, Christina Adams. And me, Ellie Betts. We're here bringing you all the knowledge and techniques you need to achieve your writing goals. Whether you want to be a number one bestseller or make a living writing what you love, we've got you covered. It's time for practical tips, hard truths, and tough love, but in the very best of ways. Shout out to our newest patron, Alison Cumming. Do you love the podcast? You can support us over on Patreon for less than your favourite coffee per month. As part of our writing community, you'll get to listen to new episodes early, enjoy bonus episodes, and take part in patron-only writing workshops whenever we hit income goals. Sounds like an absolute bargain to me. Yep. Our first workshop, when we hit enough patrons to buy a domain name for the podcast, will be on getting focused. Focus during writing sessions and deciding which idea you should be focusing on right now. Which is definitely a big problem we see a lot, right? And that's why we chose it. If you like the sound of all that, visit writerscookbook.com forward slash support. How's your writing been going this week then? Writing is good. I am still working on my script, which is slow going, but I feel like I'm improving. I'm getting better at translating what I can see in my head onto the page into a script instead of prose. I feel like because I've been doing it just simply into prose for so long, that feels more natural. But as you know, I love, love, love learning new skills and working on my writing skills. So it's aside from the fact that I'm getting the project done, it's actually quite satisfying to be building that new skill set. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think there's a lot to be learned in terms of script writing, which can translate in back into prose. Because I know you're doing it prose to script, but then what you've learned in script, particularly in terms of things like description and how things are visual, will really help. It will. I mean, the project that I'm doing, I'm sort of challenging myself to write it with as little dialogue as possible to emphasize how much you can tell through the um, visuals. So that's working well. In actual fact, I know I said on a previous episode that I started writing some of it in prose to translate it into a script. But I actually stopped doing that, (laughs) which is how I know that uh, I've improved because I'm not relying on referring back to the prose for the scenes that I'm writing. I'm, I'm feeling more confident in writing them directly on the page. I'm almost at the proofreading stage for the ghost call. I'm on track to send it to beta readers very soon, not beta readers, arc readers very soon. And it's a little bit nerve wracking, but also exciting to finally unleash it on the world. And it is now up for pre-order on Amazon as well as Apple and Kobe. So if you do want to be one of the first to meet Neve and Edie, you can check out christinaadamsauthor.com and all the pre-order links will be on there. And for this week only, from the 17th of May through to the 23rd, all three of my nonfiction books will be on sale. So you can get writing myths, productivity for writers, and how to write believable characters for 99p or 99 cents or whatever your country's equivalent is. We can't list every single price range because we'll be here until we're grey. But they're they're on sale. That's true. 99p or 99 cents is an absolute steal for those books. I uh, will definitely be sending some links out to everybody. (laughs) Thank you. It's appreciated. I mean, they're there to help you whatever stage you are at in your writing career. Writing myths is really good if you're just starting out and you want to find out a little bit more about how the industry works and what your future career could look like and also can help inform you make some career choices. Productivity for writers is great if you're struggling to get focused or you can't concentrate or you are plagued with self-doubt. It goes really deep into how to figure out what is holding you back. And then how to write believable characters takes a psychological approach to creating characters, thinking about what makes us tick and what makes us human and how we can apply that to our characters. And like I say, that is on sale for this week only there is a lot of good content in there so i cannot emphasize how much of a steal 99p is <laughs> well thank you and don't forget the paperbacks are available as well if you'd prefer to read the paperbacks for the nonfiction, because i know a lot of people prefer nonfiction in paperback form we will include links to all three of them in the show notes for you so that you can go and check them out 
So then, Christina, you've been full-time self-employed for just over a year now. Time certainly does fly when you're having fun. What is the biggest challenge you have faced during the last year? It's motivation. And this is something no one really talks about or considers unless they are already self-employed. Which makes sense, I guess. Um, Why is it so much harder to stay motivated when you're self-employed instead of doing a typical nine to five? When you've got a day job, you always have your boss breathing down your neck for want of a better way of putting it, saying, have you done that? You're you're responsible to other people, but you you lose that when you become self-employed. But it's also a lot of writers who write very fast and still have a day job are often doing it to get out of that day job so then by the time you do that it feels like the pressure is off but actually the pressure is on and it is more pressure because you're now relying on that income to pay the bills quite a different scenario it sounds quite stressful to me uh not that it's not something i'm aiming for obviously i would love to be able to write full time but i guess the uh the security makes it a little less stressful doing my nine to five currently In the last year then, what have you done to mitigate some of that stress and that pressure that our listeners could do too? When you're kind of stuck in this ball of anxiety or stress that can even lead to depression, it can be quite isolating. And it's really important that you do whatever you can to feel less alone. And also it helps network with other people who are in the same boat, not necessarily just other writers, but other self-employed people. I'm a part of Andrew and Pete's small but mighty business community called Atomic and I have been for three or four years now I lose count and I found that it really really helps. It's a super uplifting community and I've met some lovely people and even got some clients from there. They've also just relaunched their membership and now have a free plan which includes something called their success predictor and what this does is you fill in a bunch of questions and then it will give you a percentage likelihood that your business will succeed and then it also suggests ways that you can improve and courses you can do to help that sounds so interesting i didn't know they did that and as we all know there's always room for improvement and the successful writing career is first and foremost a business it is i don't think enough people treat it as a business but i have noticed that those who are successful are the ones that are treating it as a business how can we find out more about all of these things you just mentioned we will stick an affiliate link in the show notes below And joining through this won't cost you anything, but we will get a small commission for everyone who signs up for a paid membership through our link. And I honestly can't recommend Atomic enough. Everyone is really lovely and the success predictor is really clever. It suggested exactly what I need to improve on my business and... I haven't actually done the course yet, but I fully intend to. And I know it's going to be great because Andrew and Pete are the perfect balance of knowledgeable and funny. And so you you do feel like your head's going to explode from all of the information, but you're going to have a laugh at the same time. And what better way to remember what you need to do? Absolutely. Sounds fantastic. It can be quite hard to maintain motivation anyway. Uh, what do you do on the days where you feel less motivated? I found... I can't remember what it was sometime last year that I am more productive on the days that I meditate at the start of the day or also if I exercise I try and do both I try and exercise then meditate but if I exercise too much my knee or my back gives out because I'm secretly about 90 so I always try and meditate and I found the more I meditate the kind of calmer my brain is and the more the easier it is to stay focused and I also have a to-do list so I write everything down that needs to be done and I generally write that to-do list the night before So I can't forget stuff and I'm in less of a mad panic. And that also helps me sleep. And so I would always say have that to-do list and maybe you even need to go to the extreme extreme of going during 9 and 10, I'm going to do this. During 10 and 11, I'm going to do this and really plan out your time because it helps to keep you focused. And I would also say don't forget the rewards. Like I sometimes reward myself with a really nice lunch, for example. Hmm, All very useful things that we can start to do. Writers, if you have any other tips for getting motivated when you just don't want to, let us know in our Facebook group. We would love to hear your tips. You can check it out at writerscookbook.com forward slash Facebook group. Yep, we would definitely love to hear what you've got to say. And the thing is, something that you think is a really simple fix could actually completely change someone's life. All ideas, no matter how small, can make a massive difference. So do pop into the Facebook group and let us know. Yes, please do. When you are self-employed, there is no safety net for you to fall back on. How do you find that? Pretty damn scary. Everyone finds it different, but you can either learn to focus on the solutions or you can 
dwell on the problems and let it destroy you. You know, the most important thing is that you're flexible and adaptable and you don't let these setbacks stop you because if they do, then you can't pay the bills. Of course. Yeah, you've got to keep going, right? Even though you dreamt of being a full-time writer for ages, I am sure it is not all perfect. What else did nobody tell you about being a full-time writer? I remember when I first considered this, Joanna Penn said it generally takes about three books for a series to pick up. But by the time I started, it was more like four or five or six even. The other thing to consider is that every series is different. My What Happens In series and my Hollywood Gossip series and my Spotlight book is related, but they all perform very differently. If you're a slow writer, four books for the series to pick up is, you know, that could be four years, it could be five years, it could be even longer. And if it's a shorter series, the rules are obviously different, but generally as an indie, longer series will be more profitable unless your model is standalone. I'm not the best person to comment on shorter series and standalones because for some reason I have an obsession with writing long series and they get longer the more I work on them. But that that is kind of the general consensus is that the longer series will make you more money because people get attached to the characters, not you. Of course. Yeah. Hollywood Gossip was supposed to just be, a, well, it is a spinoff of the What Happens in the series. Did you expect it to be as successful from the get go? Kind of did. Yeah. But then I thought about it and what happens in books are third person, whereas Hollywood Gossip is first person and also it deals with very different themes and gets a lot, lot darker than the Hollywood, than the Hollywood Faith books. And so it does make a difference. It affects who is interested because not everyone is going to want those darker tones. They're going to want the more lighthearted read that you get from the what happens in books. And I've only really noticed that Hollywood gossip picked up when Hollywood did the series. I mean, when the fourth book, Hollywood Destiny, was published and when I ran a sale to promote the, the launch of Hollywood Destiny. Because the thing to remember is that readers get attached to Holly and Faith, not to me. So there's no guarantee that they are going to follow me from one series to the next. You know, Tate and Jack are in the What Happens in books along with Holly and Faith, but he intentionally left a lot out so that I could put it in their own spin-off. And Tate and Jack have a very on-off relationship. And so that kind of relationship isn't for everyone particularly when it also deals with darker themes like racism like adoption like abuse and misogyny and all these things that for some people are very uncomfortable reads but I didn't want to shy away from that because Hollywood isn't always a nice place and people aren't always nice and just because someone is in a position of power that doesn't mean everyone is going to be super nice to them or maybe they are too nice to the point where it is detrimental or people in positions of power go on a power trip and then someone is on the receiving end of that and that's part of one of the themes of Hollywood Destiny is that even though Tate is perceived as being quite rich and quite powerful she still essentially ends up being someone's what's the word I'm looking for verbal um battering gram shall we say even though she's technically done nothing wrong they treat her like she has just because of her background so if we just go back to that point you made about readers following the characters rather than the actual author yourself how do you cope with that i imagine it'd be quite disheartening when people are more interested in well, i suppose it's a good thing that they're more interested in your writing but how, how did you cope with the fact that they're more interested in the characters than yourself it can certainly be disheartening i'm i'm not gonna lie but i generally coped by writing more because remember this is why i got into it because i love to write i don't enjoy the publishing process i enjoy the writing process but i don't want to just leave a gazillion books sitting on my hard drive without anyone else to enjoy them so I generally dealt with that by writing side projects, things like Behind the Spotlight, my nonfiction books, and also The Ghost Call, because then no one really knows about them until I'm ready to release them, except for my beta readers and my writing friends. And so the pressure is kind of off. And so I could just have fun with it, you know, and I can do what I did in December, which was write two books in the same series no one knew about back to back and just experiment and create ridiculous comedic characters like a 4,000 year old mummy. And I also did some expressive writing, which I always say is a great thing to do if you're feeling particularly pissed off about something, because it just helps to get out those pent up emotions. You may feel guilty for admitting the fact you're annoyed about the way your readers behave. And I'm not saying I do, but if you do, expressive writing is a really good way to get out that 
those emotions, whether they are guilt or anger or whatever else, because it just stops you from bottling things up. And the other thing that stops you from doing that is ranting to friends, either on video or in person, if you can meet up or even just written rants to, to really get it off your chest and just express what you are going for it through. Because it doesn't matter what stage you're at, you will experience frustrations. And if you have someone who is a willing ear, that makes a huge difference. So even though the last year or so has been fantastic for you, it sounds like there was clearly a lot going on. I guess I I kind of have to ask, did you almost quit at any point? No, but I have had a couple of meltdowns. I'll be honest with you. You know, I'm not perfect and this is all new to me and I am figuring it out as I go along. And one thing I will always remember is that when I went for an interview, a job, the actual CEO of the company, who had had multiple businesses at this point, actually said to me, no one knows what they're doing. They are all making it up as they go along. And to have someone who is A, older than me and B, more experienced than me and C, a hell of a lot richer than me say that definitely filled me with much more confidence and made me feel like, well, okay, if he doesn't know what he's doing, then it doesn't matter if I don't either. I like that. Very open and honest, both from him and yourself. When you're doing client work, obviously you have a deadline for that, which I assume helps. But when you're publishing your books, the deadline comes from you. How do you handle that? So when it comes to writing and editing, I generally focus on one book at a time. I may have like one side project, but I will focus on the one. So for example, I focused on Hollywood Destiny and my side project was The Ghost Call. And quite often I would do some edits on Destiny and then my reward would be to edit Ghosts. And I generally plan publishing wise about one or two books ahead. I will have most of the series mapped out in my head. But in terms of publishing and what I talk to readers about, that's as far as I go. And I do find that it is a lot easier when you are doing what you want to do, because as cheesy as it sounds, it feels less like work because you're enjoying it. What would you say to someone who says it does feel like work? You can't enjoy every part of the process. Like I detest proofreading. I love the point up until I send stuff to beta readers and I enjoy reading beta readers feedback but then it gets to making those changes and that's kind of when I start to procrastinate and be like oh maybe I should give the dog a bath or maybe I should do an extra half an hour of yoga or something or just do anything that is not copy editing and proofreading but like 60 to 70 percent of the process I genuinely love and I love them a lot but if you hate most of the process you have to ask yourself why you're doing it you're basically torturing yourself like what's the point point? and if you love most of it but hate certain parts consider what you could outsource i suppose things like proofreading and cover design even keyword research yeah it's sometimes better to give things you hate to the experts anyway for example professional cover designers will understand that a cover design is part art and part science and they will also be able to do the research much more efficiently or maybe even not need to do the research because they've already done it for someone else so that's a lot faster and a lot less frustrating than if you're doing it yourself and I know that a lot of authors on a budget might go oh yeah I can do a cover myself I am begging you unless you have photoshop and design experience do not do your own book cover you have to promise me you won't do your own book cover because it is hard and it is stressful I promise I'm not gonna try thank you thank you for some genres it's easier like non-fiction and women's fiction for example fantasy you would never ever find me designing a fantasy cover for example because they're much more complicated but if you have a background in design it's not so bad like I had 10 plus years of design experience before I did my own covers and I'm by no means saying that I am great there is a high probability I will probably redo all of my covers at some point and get a professional to do it but there's no point until the series is finished you know but as I say when you outsource to someone else they'll be able to do it to a higher standard than you and probably faster which means that you're more likely to make money from your product in the short and the long term and you have to spend money to make money regardless of what business you are in and book publishing is a super long-term game super long term what do you mean by super long term i mean years like i published what happened in new york in 2016 it's its fifth birthday on the 26th of may oh happy birthday what happens in new york yes we, we will be doing a sale <laughs> we'll be doing a sale to celebrate and maybe a live live video and the series didn't take off until 2019 and by that point i had published four books in the series And I went through a hell of a lot to get to that point. I learned a lot about marketing, about writing, about readers, about advertising, about just everything I needed to know, basically. If I'd focused on the quick win instead of continuing to do what I loved, which was the writing part, 
and also chasing what I've always wanted to do, which was make a living from writing, I never, ever could have gotten here. I would have just given up years ago. And the other thing that really helps is having multiple streams of income, particularly when you're starting out, because then you're not just relying on book income, which can be notoriously unpredictable. I have noticed that multiple successful full-time writers emphasize the importance of having multiple streams of income. What exactly does that look like for you? So for me, I have my eBooks. I've got 13 books out now and they're available on Amazon, Apple, Kobo, Google, etc. And there are also paperbacks available of most of my books. I have my writing courses, some on mindset, some on craft, and I teach some in person as well when we're allowed to. We've got the Patreon as well. And also I write blog posts and video scripts for businesses. And I'll be honest, if I did just one of those things, I'd probably get bored. Yeah, I I can imagine you'd get bored doing one thing all the time. So (laughs) that makes sense to me. But it's it's about more than just the boredom, right? Writing books is a long-term payoff, so you you have to have multiple incomes to make up the consistent income you lose from your 9-to-5 day job, right? And having that adds a layer of security. Wanting to rely on book income is a really great goal. But like I say, it is a long-term goal and a really long-term goal. You get occasional people who have runaway successes, but they tend to be in certain genres and they tend to have money to spend on ads up front. And quite often this is the people who are already retired. So they've got some leftover money and they've got a lot of time on their hands as well. It's important for our readers to know that while your short attention span is definitely an issue and you have to mitigate the boredom, it's not the only reason for multiple multiple incomes, right? Yeah, I I really couldn't write, publish and market books 24-7. I like using client work to break it up because they're shorter pieces, which means quicker wins. And in between like sales lulls, which are inevitable, they do act as a reminder that I can actually write. Certain algorithms will only promote your book for a set amount of time and then they will go down unless you're running some sort of upper. So if you've got big gaps between releases, you might then struggle in the algorithms for a little bit. Like, for example, Amazon only really cares until your book is about three months old other platforms really like pre-orders and then there might be a big lull and then because your book's a bit older platforms like Apple and Kobo might start to pay them a bit more attention because they're more established so it's a bit of a weird model depending on the platform but you need to fill that void somehow particularly if you don't have thousands of pounds of dollars to spend on advertising every month thousands thousands of pounds yeah. to make it to the big leagues yeah you need to be spending thousands i mean roughly for me i generally double what i make on my ad spend so if i spend 100 i'll make 200 etc but there's no guarantee of that because it depends on everything from the image to the copy to the audience and audiences do get tired of seeing the same ad over and over again and once they start to get that ad fatigue then there is diminishing returns on running that ad and it might even become more expensive to run it but you're still running it and then you end up actually losing money so you always need to be on the ball and paying attention and so it is generally only the full-time authors who are spending that much or people who like I say are retired because they've got all that time to learn. Wow I had no idea it would be quite that much money uh (laughs) so whether we are in the big leagues or we're in the small leagues and we want to become big league one day what skills or attitudes does someone need to survive being self-employed the biggest thing you need is a growth mindset which means you're always open to learning and growing and the book of the week that i'm about to mention will help with that Also, like I mentioned at the start, you need to focus on solutions, not problems, so you're not wasting your energy on the wrong things. Money management is really important as well. Even if you have an accountant, you need to know what you've got coming in and out and what you can afford to spend on ads and do a bit of maths because Amazon isn't great at it and also Amazon likes to pay you late. And also confidence that you can pull this off because nobody will believe that you can do it if you don't first and foremost. I have definitely noticed a huge difference in you since you became self-employed. I know it's been really hard work, don't get me wrong, but you are so much happier and better off now in terms of mental health and quality of life. I feel like it's a really good move for you. Thank you. I mean, like you say, it has been hard and it's been a hell of a journey and it's an ongoing journey, but I'm enjoying the journey direction it's going in even if some days are more stressful than others which is inevitable whatever you're doing (laughs) this is true 
Don't forget to share your motivation tips or even your tips on life as a self-employed writer in our Facebook group. And again, just once more, that is writerscookbook.com forward slash Facebook group. And now it's time for a book of the week. Book of the week. This week, it is Black Box Thinking by Matthew Syed. And this ties in nicely with the growth mindset that I mentioned a minute ago. This is where I learned what a growth mindset was and how to change my programming. Because I was brought up to believe that everything was very black and white. And if you were right, you dug your heels in. And if you're wrong, you dug your heels in. And that's not healthy. And that's not how you develop a successful business. So whether it is in business or whether it is in your personal life, being open to learning and growing is really, really important. And that is what this book taught me. I'm not saying that everyone is perfect or that we've always got a growth mindset, but it is a sliding scale and it is a learning curve. And some things we will be much more open to having a growth mindset for than others. But the more you have it, the more possibilities are open to you and the more confident you will feel. And it's also a lot more fun, I think, rather than digging your heels in just because something isn't going how you want it to. If you are flexible and versatile and open minded, then you will get a lot more out of every experience absolutely i 100 percent support that statement the one thing i would say is don't read that book if you're about to go on a plane or have surgery or someone you know is about to have surgery because the two main stories that it follows one is about surgery gone wrong and the other is about airplanes because of black box is a a airplane metaphor so yeah don't yeah but it's there's kind of a happy ending from them but the whole point of the book is you've got to go through the hardship to get to the learning interesting interesting Remember to grab your copy of Writing Myths, Productivity for Writers and How to Write Believable Characters on sale for this week only. You can find the link to all of those in our show notes. Did you find this episode enlightening? Don't forget to hit the shiny, shiny subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. And tell all of your friends how awesome it is as well. Definitely. You never know who it could help. Speaking of helping, you can support The Writer's Mindset over on Patreon for less than your favourite coffee a month. Join our growing gang of writers and get early access to episodes, bonus episodes and patron-only writing workshops when we hit our goals. And free Ellie hugs if they ever meet you. Absolutely. I am a big hugger. Uh, I don't force hugs on people, but anyone's up for a hug, I'm there. I do hugs though. Sorry, it's it's not my style. I'll give um, people two hugs in lieu of your hug. (laughs) But you, you, I think you're more of a resting bitch face type of person. I deny <laughs> that, but... You just can't deny the truth. And on that note, we'll see you next time. Keep writing! Keep writing.